so back to you in white face some people have found it quite disturbing they've said the white face and a lot of the things that I talk about are sometimes um, as disturbing so be disturbed today I'd like to introduce to you a book that has totally enthralled me as of late it is called lose your mother a journey along the Atlantic slave route by Saidia Hartman released in India by a publisher just across the street uh, Naviana that publishes uh, Dalit and black radical um, work here in India and so I picked up this and Angela Davis's uh, new book or one of Angela Davis's newer books but new newly published here and um, I have I just I can't tell you and I would like to tell you many things about this book um, first of all first off um, going along exploring the Atlantic slave trade um, and, and things in the life and economies and things around it has always really fascinated me um, and it always I remember very early seeing very keenly um, in school uh, and in mixed company how spoke how talking about the Atlantic slave trade was so somber and serious and um, shameful and guilty and all those things but at home we could talk about and laugh about it we could explore life around it I mentioned in another video that I played Toussaint Louverture um, at five you know five six years old in a little production so these are the different ways that we were learning about the Atlantic slave trade at home versus never having even mentioned Toussaint Louverture in any of my formal education until I um, graduated high school and went to college. And then I was surrounded by people who could speak in such a way. So I want to say with this book, and I'm going to read just a little bit, that what I find interesting about this book is that my experiences are so different from the authors. She talks about um, stories around the Atlantic slave trade in her family and how it stops um, at the trade, stops at the port. And obviously my experience is different because I am a black American and I'm also Nigerian. So I do know um, when she says that she goes to Ghana and much of the book that I've read so far, I'm only on the third chapter, is, is about her experiences in going to Ghana and looking from looking at the slave trade from the she she feels very haunted by it, very um, wanting to find and retrace the steps. And I say this is something, um, ideas around this have interested me since I can think of. But my interest, for example, leads me to want to take a boat trip, a boat trip from, say, um, any of the ports. Um, could be around Dakar, um, up to I want to go along the triangle, you know, maybe up to Liverpool, um, maybe even down to New Orleans, somewhere even, you know, in the Caribbean and Central and South America. I would like to just crisscross the Atlantic and know it. And in a sense, um, in my mind, it's almost like I, w I want to know the route, I want to know Middle Passage, but I also want to know, think about, meditate on becoming an American and the becoming of the Americas. So that brings me to the most interesting point that the part that I'm going to read made me think of. And it is this. I introduced this piece by talking about how different these were slavery, the Atlantic slave trade was spoken of in different contexts. And it is to say that on the other side of it, I think that many the people in the dominant culture in America are unaware of how dominant their culture is. Um, I think that we still live in a time and a place where all things black are black. You know, so it might be a little cool and radical, but we all know what cool and radical means. It's like, it's cool and radical because it's dangerous. It's, um, it's ultimately filthy and not the one that you would take home to your wife, but the one that you would screw. And, um, and of course, uh, people who are well-versed in this language would know that I mean that as uh, 
both literally and metaphorically and literally and metaphorically and over and over and over because in so many ways the relationships across race as she speaks about her family and looking at her genealogy um, are just a series of being screwed you know and, and how there is a lot of silence you know Aunt Laura never shared any anecdotes about the ones who crossed the Atlantic from Africa there were no anecdotes Genealogical trees don't flourish among slaves, as Frederick Douglass remarked. In my family, too, the past was a mystery. The story boiled down to remote white men missing black fathers, lies and secrets about paternity and wayward lines of descent. And see, even on my American side, my family is so different from this. It's not just that my, my mother and my and, and her sisters took their mother and her and their and her sisters to New Orleans, the earliest port that we could find of any trace of our family in this new world. Went to a graveside, you know, site where they thought the first, you know, the, not the, obviously not the first, but at least the, as far back as they could trace was. Um, in New Orleans, um, as you all know, is it was a port. <laughs> And it's in, in, in such a significant port that it gave birth to, dare I say, um, American music. So I also don't have the kind of silence in my family. So we talk as much as we possibly can about who and what and why and, you know. So these things don't carry the somberness. In fact, they become narratives, interesting stories about life, parables. Um, that you can mine for how people lived and the lessons they learned. And so it's so starkingly shocking to me when I go to, when I speak with people who see slavery as only from the, the context of the guilt-ridden slave owner, um, because it just totally denies an entire history that I think many people share um, that also fed my curiosity and, and going and living in Africa and, and even my experiences in Africa and I lived in Mali, you know, the one thing that she talks about that there are so many African American expatriates in Ghana that, and they're shunned and there's the shame of slavery and I'm just, I'm shocked that there's sla shame around slavery. I mean, I lived in Mali where there are people who to this day, the Bella people, um, the people who do the, that dance. Um, and wear shackles, in a sense, are slaves, modern-day indentured servants. Now, of course, you and I know that that's very different from shadow slavery. Um, but most of the book to hear has been mourning about the relationship between African and African Americans and who sold who and that sort of thing. And I'm fascinated by it because that I've, 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 I've heard that that fascinates that that disturbs many African American people. I see that, but I, I guess I've never taken to heart how much it really injured people. Because I guess even before I went to Africa, before I got to know more of my Nigerian family and lived in Mali and visited Senegal and Ivory Coast before war, during peacetime, um, and the Gambia and, you know, um, I don't know, I just never was really preoccupied with the, with being dissed by Africans. And I, and I have a video, the Kuhn video, um, where I essentially ridicule a man who is very injured by that relationship. And uh, um, I'm starting to have a little bit more empathy for that, that, that deep injure. Now, as people, we're all flawed. So the Bible says, so, so, so Buddhism says. Um, but what, how we are flawed, I think, is, is a, a ver very deep philosoph philosophical rift. Um, and so one of the philosophies of being f flawed humans you find in um, black culture. And as you know, black culture is as new as the Atlantic slave trade. And so um, she also goes on, and we often you know, try to dissect the parables of the you know, sooner we'll be done with the troubles of the world because we know that these people are, in a sense, talking about death. Wish it, on the surface, it sounds like they're wishing for death, right? But we obviously know that they weren't, that they were, that, that because the all evidence points to the freedom, right? And some very real aspects of what freedom meant because freedom never meant, you know, I escape and, and that's it. And, you know, it was all, there was an underground railroad. 
there were um, societies of people who would welcome recent escapees. There were movements of people. There were, so this is all to say that um, to really understand even what those people were saying, singing in those songs, we can never understand. What's even more interesting is that the, the beats that they, that when we talk about the chain gang beats and all those things that are very obviously clearly linked to hip hop, those were even more ignored by the, uh, the, the, the dominant masses. I think that they, you, they're only found in, in the funk today. So that's something else that we can explore, but this, these are all of the things that keep coming up for me in my mind for this, for, um, from reading this. And it goes, and, and, and it's a point that I started early and I want to close there, just had to see how much time I had. And it's this, it's that the, the, the dominant culture has so much guilt and shame that frames slavery in just this. That we can only talk about it as a shame, a guilt, a past that is severed like that, just to be forgotten about. Well, we all know that there are even people who have severed limbs that, have, that can feel them. And I think that we're very much injured in, injured in that way. And so when it comes to healing, I think that there's also a lot of logic to be found from this culture, because the fact is, um, the intentions of slavery and, and the injury of being sold off, of being captured, um, of being transported in such heinous conditions to, the, to such an unknown place, and, to, and, and then to be auctioned off, and then to be sold. I mean, you, you're thinking, you know, you come from Africa, somewhere in the interiors of Africa, to be captured, to be sold off, traded for very little, um, or even captured from the Congo and then sold in Ghana until it became so lucrative on the plantation systems in the new world. I mean, just all the uncertainty around what is happening to you. I mean, you know, you talk about rendition. Just imagine just being captured and your life is over. And I would like to imagine it. I would like to imagine what comes of that, though. And there are so many stories in American popular culture that are so Eurocentric. And I think that the extent to which they're Eurocentric, people just don't understand. But I'll give you one example. Um, Bible studies. Bible stories are told, even in popular American culture, even in stories like Superman, the Oedipus Jesus sun god. And so to say that um, we're all multi and everyone fits in, no, we have a dominant and imperial culture in America, and it's very different from my culture, from the, from the vernacular that we speak at home, from, from culture, everything culture, music, dance, but also knowledge. Um, and so I think we have to acknowledge that there is whiteness. It's effectively what I'm saying. And not this blanketness, not this blandness, not this neutrality. Um, and so to say that, you know, looking at race or mentioning race is to be racist is ignorant. Um, because it doesn't acknowledge that, um, A, that there's beauty in blackness, even though it was maybe forged in a deep amount of hatred and self-hatred on many sides, and the kind of karma collected to be sold in bond, in, 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 into bondage, I cannot, ima I cannot imagine. But I would be able to imagine it if I had hundreds and thousands of hours of television shows and movies and stories based on Bible stories. I mean, the, even I think about the show Smallville. Every time I look at it, I'm like, this is, these are Jesus stories. Over and over and over, even the, the, even the whole bit about the, the boy being in a barn all the time, all the daggone time, the little carpenter's son. It's, it's beyond you know, belief to me in how people appropriate those stories and reappropriate the stories for each and every time, but to suit their own egos. So yeah, even though you know, Jesus is supposedly born um, in the Middle East, Christ, you know, dom the dominant Christian imagination of Jesus today is some white guy, I mean, like that. So that's appropriating a narrative and then sticking your own ego on top of it. And that's something very different than what you find in these slave narratives. You find a m much more of a we, a, different, a very different kind of ethic. And they're often at war in America, culturally. Um, but we can imagine them if we had, you know, a, an entire Star Trek series um, that was based on, you know, all the fa fantasies around 
the Atlantic slave trade. So instead of going out and conquering, maybe a Star Trek would be about freedom. So imagine all of the stories in America and our, our, our heroes all about conquering and domination of right over wrong. And we, of course, know what's morally right because, you know, it's our ego. Instead of those stories, what if there were freedom? What if those were the stories of good and bad? How do you like that?